Hey guys, welcome to Capturing Christianity. Today I am joined by none other than Mark Lozano with Christ Center Capital. We're going to be talking about his story, his conversion from atheism to Christianity, and then also what he does as a living. And uh, that's also really, it's a really, really cool story, the way that he transitioned and what he does now. But uh, let's start by, we'll just jump right into the interview. Why don't you tell us a little about your background? Like, because you worked in the MBA for a little while, and then you eventually started Christ Center Capital. But let's start with like, you were you were actually like a hardcore atheist for how many years? Yeah, so um, context is key. I'll try to give as much context as quickly as possible. Um, I was born Catholic, but not raised. Okay. So I uh, made the sacraments, um, didn't go to church. It was kind of just, you know, a lot of people know that they just kind of go through the a lot of Catholics just go through the motions, right? And my family is one of those families. And we, and I think after I made my confirmation, I didn't go back to church from age 11. So in my, in my mind, I'm like, all right, this is not something to be taken seriously. And that point of like not going back to church, not really being pushed to as a young kid. And growing up, I started to become more and more agnostic then more and more atheistic and I would always say I was agnostic but if someone actually pushed me on it I mm -hmm. was definitely athe I was definitely an atheist and um, fast forward all the way to college well let's, let's pause there real quick so what what was it like that made you an atheist or an agnostic so um, the fact that my family didn't really like make it a point to go to church it was something like oh we shouldn't take this seriously and then when my mom actually did give me pushback on it a little bit i brought up one of the worst arguments ever of like the game of telephone so i okay. said in first grade when you, you know you go through that whole game of telephone i tell you and then by the end of the 10th kid like the story is completely different i was like how can we trust the bible if we do that it was a terrible argument but it was an argument my 13 year old mind made up and was like ah it's sufficient so why should I believe that or do anything about that and then once I made that point of like all right the Bible's not anything serious church isn't anything serious then it uh, put me down that path of just being you know agnostic atheistic and just really hedonistic okay so yeah so that but that part or that that uh, sort of the catalyst that made you go down the atheistic path like you just said like you don't think that that's actually a good reason but that nevertheless was like the reason yeah. why you became an atheist around the age of 13 and then how long did that last so that lasted all the way up until probably the age of 24 25 okay yeah um, did you did you like dur so during sorry I'm like I feel like I'm cutting you off a lot because I'm just super no, interested please. in your your story so during that time, did you like? Did you come across other atheistic arguments that like maybe helped solidify your atheism, or were you just like kind of not interested? I was definitely not interested for the the big majority of that time span. I wasn't interested at all, and I was so focused on my own pleasure from high school into college and everything. I I you know played basketball and was. Uh, I played basketball, was really big on like making sure that I had better grades than classmates. You know, I was into athletics, academics, and like philosophy, theology, anything like that. It didn't even enter my mind after I kind of made the decision to, okay. that like God wasn't of importance. Yeah, yeah. But then, so continue the story. So like around the age of 24, 25, you started to look so into things? It started earlier than that because when I went to college, my I met my soon-to-be wife, or my future wife, and she was a cradle Catholic. And she had a very innocent faith, but she was very devout. We kind of like fell in love over basketball because she was on the women's team, I was on the guys' team. She was way better than me in guy-to-girl ratio. She was like a thousand-point scorer and starter and everything, and I was, you know, end-of-the-bench kind of guy. But we fell in love over basketball, but we fought constantly. 
like constantly because of my um on interest in religion or even my kind of like militant opposition to uh religion especially catholicism because that was the one i was familiar with and i was like no i know that's a bunch of nonsense in my mind at the time and uh but we for whatever reason we stuck it out even though we argued constantly through like we started dating probably my sophomore year of undergraduate school mm -hmm. and we argued all the way up through grad school <laughs> but we stayed together for some reason that was god's grace i don't know why and um but through that time i was like i stayed with her for so long i was like all right i i know that i love you right but i need you to get rid of this nonsense of religion and christianity and everything else so i was like i'll prove you wrong she wasn't someone who had like the all the intellectual answers of you know she wasn't going to be able to respond to deep theological questions or anything like that so i was like i'll do my research and i'm an obsessive nature by from what i do for christ center capital and everything i have a very obsessive nature so like when i start on something i have tunnel vision that whole time so I read everything I could get my hands on, listened to every single lecture, every single debate, classes, all this stuff. And long story made short, I became kind of the most reluctant convert in Florida at the time. So the, the famous uh, C.S. Lewis line, he was like the most reluctant convert in London. Uh, I was definitely the most reluctant convert in Florida because I read so much. I mean, I did the catechism cover to cover. I read the Summa Theologia. I did read the confessions i read uh you know the quran and i just i read everything that i could get my hands on listened to every debate listened to every lecture read every book by like the new atheists and everything and even though i wanted like the new atheists to be right i wanted catholicism i wanted christianity specifically to be wrong i was like anything but please i couldn't i don't know i just couldn't uh i could not admit or I could not accept that um, atheism was true. Like I couldn't, yeah, just there was so much in me that like even though I didn't want Christianity to be true, like it was just this pull. And I, I didn't want it to be there. I was very, very opposed to it. But what finally I decided to get on my knees and say. So <clears throat> what was like the first thing that you read from a Christian that made you think, oh, hang on a second, like this might actually be true do you do so, you ever have like some does something stick out in your mind so um it's an overused quote but uh saint augustine when he said the heart is restless until it rests in thee and i was like because at the time i had kind of accomplished my my goals right i uh you know played college basketball i was doing really well in school i like I graduated my undergrad and grad school combined in like four and a half years. I was on like an accelerated program and everything and I had good job offers and stuff. And I realized that there was truth to what St. Augustine said in that quote. And that I remember being one of the first points where like, all right, I really got to think about this now because my heart is restless and I've achieved the things I want to achieve, but I'm still... I was, hindsight being 2020 I was miserable mm. I didn't re quite realize I was miserable at the time but then I realized you know getting to know my wife and getting to know um, people who kind of took their faith a little bit more seriously I was like I'm more successful than these people but they seem to be a lot happier than me and that bugged me and uh, then you know going through and reading everything and I, that's the one quote I think always like yeah it always stands out to me Hmm. What about during the debates that you watched or like reading the Quran or reading the Summa Theologiae? Did, was there like a specific kind of like evidence that maybe stuck out to you? Was there a, a sort of an argument for the existence of God that you were like, oh yeah, actually, I don't really know how to respond to this. So the argument from extreme skepticism, I don't know if you were familiar with it or if uh, it was something that I read, it was I can then I kind of formulated it myself. And I definitely did not have an answer for it. And it was, it's, a, it's kind of a long one, but if, if you want, I can go through it. Yeah, it's, let's go. All right, so the argument of extreme skepticism kind of goes like this, and I'm 
for all the theologians out there and stuff, I might butcher it, so please, you know, have mercy on me. But, so we, we all might be in a simulation right now, right? We could just be a brain in a vat, in a vat, you know, like we could be, you know, test tubes hooked up to us, you know, you're a figment of whatever computer simulation or I'm a figment of whatever computer simulation you're in, whatever it is. So that's like the extreme skepticism part. We could just be, but the thing that we know for sure is that existence exists, right? That's the one thing we can know for sure from a point of extreme skepticism. And from knowing that existence exists, we know that the essence of existence exists. And we're like, what is an essence? And an essence is the fullness of a thing that is, you know, able to, that the fullness of a thing that is allowing that thing to exist, right? So we talk about, uh, you know, the essence of the color blue or the essence of light. Well, there has to be something that is like perfectly blue or perfectly light to, you know, be able to have those things come to fruition. So the essence of existence exists. And then it's like, what is... What is the essence of existence? Well, the essence of existence, and I'm, there's a lot of like little caveats I can put in here, but the essence of existence eventually, essentially is there's no potentiality in it. It's complete actualization. If it's complete actualization, that means you know, it's all-powerful, all-knowing, those kind of things. And if something is, and I always said, well, yeah, but it's not all good, but if something's all-powerful, and if something's all-knowing, it would therefore have to be all good. Because if it's all powerful and all knowing, like the only reason we make bad decisions is because we're not all knowing or we're not all powerful. If you're an alcoholic and you continue to drink, it's because you either don't have the power to stop or you don't have the knowledge that it is bad. If you have both the power, the ultimate willpower, and the ultimate knowledge, you wouldn't therefore drink. And from the essence of existence, being that it's all powerful and all knowledgeable because it has no potentiality in it, that means that that essence of existence, or as St. Thomas Aquinas and all the theologians out there put it, essay, is uh, it's only going to create if that creation is good. Because it would not create if it was bad because it would know that it was bad and it would have the power not to. So that whole argument like really, really hit me hard. And I came across that argument when I was already starting to lean towards Christianity, even though I didn't want to. And when I found that argument, oh man, I was like, I racked my brain around it for months. Like, I almost didn't do anything else, just racking my brain around it and trying to figure it out of like a way out. And I couldn't figure a way out. And then I started thinking, well, it doesn't mean that Christianity is true. And then that argument continues to go down a path where it's like, so if you have this essay, this essence of existence, that's all powerful, all knowing, and therefore all good, and it created, so the creation must be good, and it must care about the creation, because if the creation's good, why would it not care about it? So that means that this essence of existence must have like a, um, it must, you know, since it cares about the existence, it cares about the creation, it must be evangelistic in some nature, not like, ex- Exclusionary, like it must be caring about its its creation and its whole. So then you start to think about, all right, well, what worldview, what uh, religion, or what philosophy really has this two components, right? It has the evangelistic component and it has a prevalence component. Because if it's all good and all powerful, it's going to try to evangelize and it's going to be prevalent in society. Not just prevalent in one country or one area or one continent, but prevalent in like the whole of creation. And when you think about it that way, there's only really two answers, and that's Islam or Christianity. Because See, I don't even think Islam would fall under that category because it Islam probably is so doesn't. Ce- it's so centrally located. Like if you look yeah. at the demographics of Islam, it's just like the Middle East is the hub of, yeah. of Islam. And then if you look at the demographics of Christianity, sorry to like kind of butt in no, here. No, please. But Christianity is just all, literally, the phrase all over the map, that's Christianity. It's like, it's in China. It's in Africa. It's it's everywhere. Like yeah. it's not just in Europe. It's not just in America. It's everywhere. Yeah. So that really hit me because, uh, I mean, and you know, we know that like Judaism isn't because there's not, like what I mean. There's like six million Jews on the face of the planet right now. It's not like they actively kind of stop people from entering their their religion. And like as you said, if we're really talking about prevalent, yeah, Christianity is much more prevalent than Islam. And then when I 
you take that and I, I've read, you know, you read the Bible cover to cover, you read the Quran cover to cover, and you're like, yeah, so the only thing that fits that essence of existence is the Christian God. And, I mean, what God cares more about their, its crea- creation than sending its own son to die. And, mm-hmm. yeah, all of those things, just that whole argument. And the funny thing is, is I read everything I get my hands on. I probably could argue both positions better than the majority of people. Um, both you know, positions is in theism like and uh, atheism, atheism, Christianity, or um, anything opposed to Christianity. And I knew so many answers, but I was still resistant until the point where I finally like got on my knees and was. And I, I remember that I say the prayer every day. It's it's your will be done, not mine. It's just your will. If you like, you're out there. If you exist, like your will be done, not mine. And then from there, I, you know, that's when I kind of in invited God in and he kicked me in the teeth (laughs) and uh I think I needed to some people some people he's gentle with some people he kind of you know throws into the fire and I definitely needed to be thrown into the fire and uh yeah that's kind of how it went and so it's funny because I had all the intellectual answers I guess or most of them or a good majority of them and uh but I still didn't like concede until I actually prayed openly and vulnerably so <clears throat> one thing that's kind of like stuck out of my mind is I, I know kind of how atheists are going to respond to your testimony and they're going to say that, oh, it's all because of your wife or it's all because of your uh, your girlfriend at the time. Yeah, your, girlfriend. Your we got girlfriend married at the around, time. when I was 25. So Okay. So uh, how would you how would you respond to that? Do you think that you're like it's all because of her or that like you would have? No, I mean, obviously God used her to like kind of pull me in, uh-huh. but I was so adamant about proving her wrong. And she knew that I was on this mission to prove her wrong. And How did she react to that? Was she just like... She, it's funny because like she didn't have the, like I said, the like those intellectual answers, you know, she wasn't, she was someone who, you know, more of a blind, blind faith, but like a very devout faith. And she, she just had confidence. She had confidence. She was like, all right, go ahead. Yeah. You know, she was like, I might not have the answer, but I know there's an answer. So she was very confident with it. And so she was confident that I would find like the answers. But I don't, the one thing that baffles my mind is that she was confident that I would accept the answers because I wasn't, I was so biased in my pursuit. I wanted Christianity, Catholicism specifically, to be wrong so badly, so passionately that. Um, that was something that kind of surprised me about her at the time of like, she was confident that I would find the right answers, but she was also confident that I would accept them. And I did not want to in any way, shape or form. And like, I, at the end of my like pursuit, at the end of my like journey, uh, to Christianity, um, of course we're always still journeying, but you know, when I kind of dismissed my atheism and accepted, I... It wasn't about her at all. It just wasn't. It was it was about my own kind of wrestling with God because at the time it was like I I was so set on the truth that I didn't care what came of it. Like I got to that point mm. where when I first started out, I want I was biased. I was really really biased, but then I got to a point where like I was so obsessive because I do I have an obsessive personality. I have an obsessive nature about me. And uh I just wanted to find out the truth so badly. And when it was the truth that I didn't really initially want, I was just like, well, I, I said I wanted the truth and I, I got it, so. Yeah. Was there a point where your affections like sort of changed where you really didn't want it to be true, but then eventually like you started to maybe see the beauty in Christianity and Catholicism that you wanted to like, you actually started to change from wanting it to be false to wanting it to be true? Was there a time when that happened or were you just reluctant the whole way? I was reluctant pretty much the whole way until after when I finally engaged in that open and vulnerable prayer. Like I hadn't really prayed. I read a lot, I listened a lot, I never really prayed. And then when I finally did the that kind of, I would keep saying the open and vulnerable prayer because I think mm. a lot of people pray and you know, they're like, please God, let me win the lottery, that kind of thing. But if it's like when you're saying, please God, show me your will, allow your will to be done, not mine, correct my own, if you're out there, please correct my own, like, um, my, my own sin in me and everything like that, then it, uh, 
once I made that prayer, then I kind of changed my tune. Even though I, pre I would consider myself a convert by then, I was a reluctant convert, and then when I started engaging in that kind of prayer, um, that genuine prayer, that's when I was like, all right, now, now I'm more happy about my conversion. I'm more joyful about it. I'm more accepting of it. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not giving opposition to it. So now let's talk about, we, we talked about your journey from atheism to Christianity, but how about your journey to Catholicism? Like, what was that like? Did, was there like a specific thing that kind of came up where you were like, now I'm convinced that some form of Christianity is true, but is it the Catholic Church? Was there something that you read or something that convinced you that Catholicism was also true? Yeah, so for the majority of, or, or for the first little stint of me being a Christian, it was more of like a mere Christianity, you mm -hmm. know, again, going back to C.S. Lewis. Um, I knew my wife was still Catholic at the time, and or still is Catholic, but I said, I feel like I had racked my brain so much on just trying to figure out Christianity. I was like, now I gotta figure, I'm, I would be in that position that you're in now, like I gotta figure out all these denominations, and oh my, I'm like, my mind's tired. I don't wanna do this anymore. But though, I realized at that point, um, I think I've talked to you on the phone about this, is I, I was so mentally exhausted from that journey to Christianity probably because of my own my own fault, like just resisting it so much, that I didn't want to go on another journey that you're on, which you can, uh, you can attest to how exhausting it is. And I was like, but I was like, wait a second. When I did the, that genuine prayer, and I asked for his will to be done, I asked for him to, to guide me, I asked for, you know, like, don't let me get in my own way. Once I said that prayer, it, I felt like things just, fell out of the sky into my lap and just kind of pointed, kept, kept pointing me towards Catholicism. And I was, uh, I started realizing the beauty of the fullness of the faith of, of the Catholic Church and that was a much easier journey for me. It was a much easier journey and it just, it did, it just kind of fell into my lap. I, I started listening to conversion stories a lot just because it was something that like I could relate to and it was really cool at that point where I was like uh, when I'm listening to conversion stories like oh yeah I remember that point in mine and blah 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 and uh, it just happened to be a lot of the conversion stories I was listening to were people like going towards Catholicism going into Catholicism and I was like I mean I still am uh, reading every day and I still ask for God's correction every day but yeah, that journey was much easier for me. I'll leave it at that. Let's transition to talking about your uh, your time at the NBA and like what was that like and how did that like factor into what you currently do now with Christ Center Capital? Yeah, so I went to school for international economics. So I was, uh, I always thought I was going to be kind of like a Wall Street guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, before I was even Christian, I said, no, I don't want to do that. I got a little taste of it. And it was only because of laziness. Like it was a kind of a bad character flaw of mine. Like it was laziness. I, I saw it and I was like, these guys are working 70 hours a week. These guys are, you know, kind of in that rat race and you know, it's dog eat dog world and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, ah, I don't want to do that. And of, for no other reason other than that I was lazy. I wasn't thinking like, oh, I wouldn't get to spend time with family. I wouldn't, it, none of that was on my mind at the time. It was just like, nah, that seems like too much work. So I got out of grad school and I started bouncing around as like a financial analyst to a bunch of jobs. I hated all of them. Like they all were just like jobs sitting in a cute, nothing against people who sit in cubicles and all that stuff. But like I was like sitting in these jobs and I just felt like I was wasting away and I despised it. And then I saw a job for, uh, I was, you know, I'm always browsing the job boards. And I see this job for the NBA come up. And my wife and I, like, as I've said, like we both play college basketball. Basketball is a big part of our lives and all that. So I was like, I would love to work at the NBA. At this time, I'm living in Pennsylvania. The headquarters for the NBA is in Secaucus, New Jersey. So it's about an hour away from where I was living. And I put in for an entry-level job for uh, what they call a game logger. So at the NBA, they kind of do this ring of fire for new people come in because it's the NBA. Like everyone wants to work for the NBA, right? Yeah. You know. So they had bring in like, at the time, they would bring in like 20, 25 new people, somewhat fresh out of college, 
and they would make them work like night shifts and everything, and you'd be a game logger. So what you're doing is like, as the game's going on, you have to like make sure the stats are coming in correctly. You have to like clip off possessions so editors and TV stations and everything can use them. You have to make sure that no one's getting triple doubles they're not supposed to or getting, you know, all that stuff. So you're kind of like a quality checker guy. And it's kind of really hard because it's fast paced. It's a um, bit of a fire. If you mess up on something, like you hear it, <laughs> like you're, uh, so it's, it's kind of like this ring of fire they put you through. And I mean, out of my class that came into the NBA, there was like 25 of us. I mean, by the end of the first season, there was only like 13 of us left. Like, cause it's like a difficult job. You get an East Coast team and a West Coast team. You're in Secaucus, New Jersey. So that's on the East Coast. And like my West Coast team, my first year was the Portland Trailblazers. So when they have a 10 o'clock game on the East Coast and then you gotta do all the stats and everything after the game and you're not getting out of there till four or 5 a.m. And it, it's kind of rough. And then you might have an East Coast game the very next day. So you're like getting out at, you know, 4 a.m. But you gotta be back at like six o'clock that day or whatever. So it's, it's a, it's a tough go. And then if you make it out of there. So anyway, I put in for that job and I had no production experience. They wanted you to have like production experience to get into that job. Well, I used to coach at IMG Academies. So IMG Academies is like the leading preparatory school for, for athletics in the country. They're in Bradenton, Florida. So basically people who like you know, they want D1 scholarships, they want a, um, you know, college scholarships for basketball, football, soccer, golf, everything, you know, swimming, they have every sport there. Um, they would say they didn't get the offers they wanted to. They would spend an extra preparatory year at like IMG Academies where like they make sure you get your SAT scores up, but they're just training you in whatever sport you choose. Very expensive school, very expensive preparatory school, but they are great at producing awesome athletes. And I, I was a coach, a skills coach there for basketball after I graduated. And IMG had just, I promise I'm tying all this together. <laughs> IMG put uh, football as their newest sport, right? And the hiring manager for the NBA was taking a New Jersey team down. She, they were like big into football. The hiring manager for the NBA was taking their team from New Jersey down to play IMG Academy's like prep team, right? And she saw a resume come up, IMG Academies. So they brought me in. They never asked me one question about the NBA. They never asked me anything. They just asked me all about IMG. They were like, what are you, you know, because they wanted, it was just this hiring manager happened to like be passionate about football and knew that the one uh, team was just started in IMG. So they were just asking me questions and stuff. And they were like, you seem like a nice enough guy. You don't really have the, the background that we need for the production, but we'll give you a shot at it. So I started at the NBA and then made it through the first year and then the business operations department picked me up because of my background of managing money. And then I spent five years working there. And, uh, and it, the business operations department is literally just like money managing, schedule managing, um, budgeting, you know, macro budgets. The NBA, I mean, they're a $10 billion revenue organization every year. So the, our business operations team, like we handled quite a bit of money and all that stuff. Yeah. So what what was your day to day like? Were you like working like eight to five? Uh, it was really, it was kind of odd. Um, they were very, as long as you got your work done, you could come in whenever you oh, please nice. kind of thing. And uh, we would, of course, travel quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of departments travel way more than I did. But, uh, you know, we would go to... NBA Finals, you go to NBA All-Star, and you travel to all these major events the NBA has. And uh, I never went overseas, but a lot of people would go overseas for like global games. And because, uh, you know, the NBA is arguably the most popular sports league in the world. A lot of people would say that some of the, the soccer leagues in Europe are, but globally speaking, like just amount of like social media followers and stuff, the NBA is always the leader. Now, here in the U.S., the NFL beats us out in the U.S., but uh, I say us like I still work there, but the NBA globally, mostly because of, like, China, India, so huge populations, and they love their basketball. They love basketball. So we're pr pretty much the the global, the most famous global league at the... And so there would be a lot of travel involved and stuff like that. So 
Put me on the timeline of your journey from atheism to Catholicism and in, in terms of like where you were at, with the MBA as well. So like yeah. during like halfway through your um, your tenure there, were you like, were you starting to look into things? Yeah, so by the time that I had started with the MBA, I was very close to that full on conversion. It took a little while for those moral Christian moral convictions to really take root in me. Um, so at the time that I was at the NBA, uh, I would say the first like year or two I was there, I was still like very uh, very much a reluctant Christian or not quite a Christian yet. And then by year three or whatever, I had re I had really committed. And then by the time I left the NBA that's when like those moral Christian moral convictions really started to take root and I started to develop some problems with the NBA of like working there and all the things that they were doing and you know a lot of the political grandstanding and stuff like that I started to really develop some issues with and uh, and then of course all the time while I'm working at the NBA I'm investing for myself right so I never managed money for anyone else I never really got into that game but I like my degrees were in international economics, so I like I played the market myself, and I, I did well for myself. And it was kind of fun when, the, well, like I keep saying, when those moral convictions took root in me, I realized that all the ways that I was making money was not something I was really proud about. So the investments I was making that I was making money off of, the paycheck I was receiving from the MBA, were just not things that, and at this time now, me and my wife have two kids going on three kids and I'm like ah I, I I start to I'm starting to make our home a Christian home and I'm trying to implement those values but then I'm the way that I'm funding my home the way that I'm paying for my home the way that I'm putting food on the table are kind of counter to those Christian values and I was like my kids are still really young but I'm like if they get older and they start asking questions and like they see what dad does for a living and everything like those are gonna be tough questions to answer so I had like some conversations with my wife and then uh, this is the next step in the journey of like all right I gotta leave the NBA for for moral purposes and I gotta leave I gotta divest for moral purposes no idea what I'm gonna do after that but these are these are like the really strong convictions we felt and we kind of see had a, I don't think a lot of people would be able to do what you did with that where you're like you realize what you're investing in, what you're doing, like your actual nine to five job is, you know, immoral in so many, so many ways. I just don't think a lot of people would be able to, to make that decision, to make that jump. So yeah. what was it like, what? So I have great stories you, for this. Okay, I was gonna say, do you, was there like some kind of spiritual experience that you had where you were like, all right, I have to like, Jesus came to you in a dream, like what happened? Um. Wow, so there's, man, so much. I'm trying to figure out which one to tell first, but like <laughs> I had so much pushing from God himself to like leave, right? I, my wife kind of had the feeling, like Taylor, Taylor, Taylor's name, my wife, she's amazing. She, she had the feeling that I was going to leave the NBA for like three years because she knew, she saw from like more, I guess more of a macro level what was going on in me internally more than what I saw myself. And she kind of, I guess, predicted that wall that I was going to run into. And I, uh, the NBA started becoming, I'll, I'll get a little political here, so excuse me if I offend anybody, but like the NBA started I'm becoming, the NBA started becoming <laughs> more and more woke the last like two years I was there. Okay. So I quit um, actually a year ago yesterday. That's when I quit the NBA. And they were putting us through like critical race theory training. They were putting us through, you know, uh, on the our MBA portal. You could pick from up team different uh, gender pronouns to label yourself as. Like the the MBA was like we we were we were fine taking money from China, you know, that was committing the Uyghur genocide, but we would speak out against common sense voter laws in Georgia like it was just a lot of things going on that I'm like man this is this is just like it's getting harder and harder to stomach because it seems to be more and more counter to like my my Christian values and I worked for a brief stint in um, 
kind of the live production entertainment uh, section of the NBA. And like we had halftime shows where kids were sitting courtside and like, you know, women are barely dressed and, you know, this kind of thing. And I'm just like, this is not something that like I'm proud about. Like when I first started working for the NBA, it was my 17 year old self's dream job because, you know, I didn't have any of those Christian moral convictions. My life was basketball and I like to manage money. And that's kind of what we were doing at the NBA. And I realized now, I was like, what I used to be proud of, now I like don't even want to tell people I work for the NBA. I used to love to tell my friends from high school and stuff, yeah, I work for the NBA now and blah, 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 like brag about it. And now like, I don't want anyone to know where I work. Like, I don't even like to wear the, the polo that has the NBA logo on it and everything. Because at the time, my wife and I are like giving talks about like sports and identity and God and like we're getting into that public space of speaking and everything. Um, Because I I told you right before we started filming like you know she had a bunch of injuries. I was like kind of that guy all-star in high school and then like end of the bench in college and we got basketball like taken away from us and we both became very miserable. So we talked to kids a lot about that. that you know find your identity in god not your sport not your Mm -hmm. job not anything else and i was like i'm giving these talks i'm like talking to my friends and my family about you know christian values and all this stuff and i'm going back to the nba that's like completely opposed to it and i was like all right and at the same time uh a good friend a mutual friend of matt frads jacob imam who runs the site new polity I listened to him on uh, Pints with Aquinas once, and he's this guy who, he pretty much has the same views as me as investing, and he was also someone who did really, really well investing for himself. I'm listening to him talk about the morality behind investing. And then I start to be like, morality behind investing? This is while I'm thinking about leaving the NBA. And I'm like, I can leave the NBA, I can just be a full-time investor, right? That's my backup plan. And I'm thinking about morality of investing, so I go back, I look at my 401k, my personal portfolio and everything, and I'm like, I'm making money off of all the organizations that that I complain about. The Amazons, the Microsofts, the Apples, the Netflix, the, all of these companies that are funding Planned Parenthood, they're funding abortion industries, they're supporting uh, the Equality Act of like transgender legislation, they're using... Uh, child labor and forced labor overseas they have unethical mining practice like all of these different things going on and I'm like these are what I'm making money off of and all of that comes together and I'm like I go to my wife and I'm saying I think I got to leave the NBA and my backup plans kind of junked because I got to <laughs> divest I can't keep investing in these companies that are making us money yeah and you can't do one without the other it's yeah. like you can't, you couldn't just leave the NBA for those reasons and then leave exactly. all of your investments there. And so I, and then the funny thing was is, so I left the NBA during like this kind of like job crisis where no one wants to work and you know, people are paying what, $18 an hour to work at McDonald's and that kind of thing. And I, me and the NBA didn't exactly see eye to eye on things, but I had a really good relationship with my boss. He was a really good guy, and did you ever tell him stuff? Did you ever like? Yeah, he know he know he knew where I was coming from, and honestly, um, not him. Like I won't say this about him or any other people at the NBA, but some people who are more like vested, older than me, kids in college, that kind of thing. They're like, I might leave too if I was in your position, like younger and that all that. But anyway, so they he kind of knew where I was coming from, and I. <laughs> Gave my two-week notice at the NBA, and I kid you not, this is the, this is a story from God. It's got to be because I give my two-week notice at the NBA. I tell everybody I'm leaving the NBA, you know, sister, parents, in-laws, friends, everybody, because I don't want to be a hypocrite because I know that they're going to come back with like an offer, you know, more money, better benefits, something like that, mm-hmm. and. I put in my two-week notice the Thursday before my last day. Uh, My boss says, hey, I know that you're kind of leaving on principle, but here's the the offer. You know, you'll probably get made into this position or whatever if you stay. 
And I was like, I, I knew that was coming in. Within a minute, maybe two minutes, I get an email from the deputy commissioner of the NBA, Mark Tatum. So, you know, head honcho under Adam Silver, for those who don't know basketball that much. But I get an email from him, company-wide email. The NBA is officially partnering with an organization called Athlete Ally. Athlete Ally operates down in Florida, and their sole purpose is to allow transgender women, biological men, to compete at the middle school and high school level sports in female sports. So Athlete Ally's sole purpose is to let boys who claim to be women compete in middle school and high school sports. Now, I started this interview one time telling you that like my wife was a thousand point scorer. She was an awesome player. We both played division two. I was Joe Schmo at the end of the bench. If me and her play one-on-one, I'm going to kill her. <laughs> like the, I'm a 190 pound man. She's a five foot three, hundred and whatever pound girl. Like it, there's, there's no comparison there. I was like, this is ridiculous. This is, and I mean, so I got that offer email. Then I got the email about athlete ally and I was like, all right, that, that's my sign. I, I really got to get out. So I got out and I uh, divested all my, um, all my investments, my personal portfolio, my 401k. And then me and my wife looked at each other and we're like, all right, what do we do now? And uh, I said, you know what? I'll go work for one of these new BRI firms. The BRI firms are biblically responsible investing. Um, you know, Christian investment firms that are kind of in opposition to the Morgan Stanley's vanguards of the world. And I started doing my research on a lot of those companies and I, I didn't really like what I found. I, I wanted them to be stricter. They were taking out explicit abortion providers but they were leaving in the companies that would fund abortion providers to the tunes of 500,000, millions of dollars a year. They were taking out explicit pornographers, but they were leaving in companies that helped promote and produce pornographic content. And I was like, and these are, you know, things like the Knights of Columbus and Ava Maria Fund and things like that that just weren't as strict as I wanted them to be. And then I realized, well, People need to know about this information. I contacted uh, Jacob Imam from the Pints with Aquinas interview, and I was like, "Listen, you struck a chord in my heart. I know what's going on, and like, I really want to do something to help this out." And I came up with the idea that in today's world, people can trade commission free on any number of platforms. I mean, on Robinhood, you can trade commission free for like up to I think it's like five million dollars or something like that. So people don't really need brokers anymore. They just need quality information. So not only do they, but in my eyes, they don't only need quality information about the financial potential of an investment, but they need moral information of that investment. Mm -hmm. What is it funding? How is it funding it? What is it doing with money? Like, what is it supporting? Is it, is it a company that has a business model that's promoting the common good, or are they just making you know carbonated sugar water that's leading to mass diabetes and uh, weight gain in the U.S. Like. What are those, um, what, is, what kind of information is there? So I thought of myself and I said, I can create essentially like a stock picking investment recommending website and I can pull the information from the market that is being recommended. So like if there's a crypto being recommended, an ETF, a stock or whatever, an alternative investment of some sort, if those things are being recommended by the market as a whole, I'll take that, put it into a report, and I'll apply moral analysis to it. And I'll let people know, like, hey, this asset's funding abortion. This asset is funding really bad politicians. This asset is doing some really nefarious things overseas. This asset's pretty good. It just focuses on business and does the right thing. And then I kind of let the investors, you know, take that information and do what they please with it. Mm -hmm. And I started that uh, about six months after I left the MBA, and that's kind of what both me and my wife are really doing full time right now. So tell me about the recent thing that just happened. Because originally this was, you had the idea of making this a sort of paid service where yeah. people could pay a monthly subscription fee and get all of this information. But now recently, as in like less than a month ago, yeah. I think you recently changed your entire business model to be 100% free. So tell me like, What's the story behind that? Like, why did you change the business model? So in the first couple months, uh, I was originally like, I wanted to make this content accessible to as many people as possible. 
that was the idea. So I was like, oh, I'll just make it like seven bucks a month because it's not free to produce. Like I got to yeah. curate a lot of information. I got to do a lot of research and I do have people helping me with that research, but it's still like, it's very time consuming and everything. But I was like, let's make it $7 a month. And then I started getting testimonies come in. Testimonials come in and people were saying like, I divested X amount of dollars from, you know, X, Y, and Z stocks that were supporting this because of the stuff I found out on Christ Center Capital and I was like, and the, the draw that Christ Center Capital has is I'm giving out information on like timely investments. I don't just have this like broad uh, category or catalog of investments. I'm saying every week I'm producing content on what the market is actually recommending that week. So mm -hmm. you can take my information and actually, you know, use it to invest timely. But I started getting these testimonies come in of like people divesting and people like, uh, you know, realigning their investment lives with like their, their Christian lives. And at the same time, I went down to a Theology of the Body conference outside of Philly with, uh, you know, Christopher West. Uh, Are you familiar? No. Uh, so Theology of the Body, that's John Paul II's teaching, you know, sex, love, and marriage and all that kind of stuff, uh, male and female. And it's like, uh, it's really popular, I guess, in the Catholic world, but Christopher West is a, a, a public speaker on the theology of the body. And um, down at this conference, I think he's been on Pints with Aquinas a couple of times and stuff like that. And down at this um, theology of the body, we had some like pretty prominent speakers. You know, you had uh, Father Mike Schmitz, you had uh, Jeff mm -hmm. Cavins, you know, the Bible in the Year gang and uh, Jason Everett, like a bunch of these like speakers and they're all talking about like the theology of the body and I'm just listening and taking it in. It was something I went to just kind of, you know, to get away for a weekend and, you know, kind of be fed spiritually a little bit. And I got to have a conversation with um, Christopher West, actually a very brief conversation. And right after all these testimonies started coming in, I was like, I was having a conversation with him and I was like, I really think God's calling me to like make this content free and like make the inf put the information out to as many people as possible. And I'm like, I keep cutting off the ways that I'm going to like make money for my family. I keep cutting off these different arms of revenue generators to like, you know, put food on the table and everything. But I was like, after these testimonies, like it's only, I was only charging $7 a month, but that still requires someone to reach into their back pocket, take out a card, put in the numbers and like, People are lazy. There's still a barrier. There's still a barrier to entry. There's still a barrier there. And I was like, I don't want a barrier there because I people need to know this because the Christian households, Christian households in the United States alone manage something like three trillion dollars. Three, that's with a T, three trillion dollars funnel through Christian households. And if only 10% of that's invested into the market, which probably more is because just about everybody and their brother has a 401k or IRA or something, that's passively invested. You don't mm -hmm. actually know the assets that's being invested there. Mm -hmm. Like, if all, if at least you know five percent of these Christians, ten percent of these Christians were able to like realize this and start to actually divest, there would be drastic changes culturally. Because the way that we invest is one of the number one ways that we can impact the culture around us. Because the culture around us is dictated by the major corporations, and the major corporations. They care about what their shareholders want. So like, you know, people will say Coca-Cola is a really woke company. They do a lot of things that, you know, maybe the Christian mindset wouldn't agree with. But I guarantee you if, you know, the Christian investment population started divesting, you know, tomorrow from Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola will come out and change their tune on a lot of different issues. Because the corporations, they care about profits. They, they're trying to appease whatever uh, majority is the loudest. And if uh, we speak, and the loudest actions we can take are the actions with our money, right? Because unfortunately, in this secular world ruled by Satan, money makes the world go round. We wish it was love, but money is what makes the world go round. So we really need to take action with our investments. And so all this is coming to my mind. I'm talking to Christopher West. He's a great public speaker. And I'm talking to a bunch of different people, like people that I really trust, mentors and everything. And they're like, hey, you should you should probably just get rid of the paywall and just uh, let the content be free. And then I replace the paywall with a pledge wall. You know, like you can come in, you can give as little a dollar a month or you can give as much as you want. But um, the more money that we get coming in, the better we can promote 
the, the moral investing content and the more content we can produce because it's not just the US. I mean, every country has their own stock exchange. I've had so many people from Canada say, hey, can you do the same thing for us up here of like, you know, the different companies that are on their stock exchange. And I was like, I would love to, but we don't have the bandwidth. Yeah. So um, we, after a lot of prayer, a lot of conversations with my wife, a lot of conversations with just a lot of people I trust, it was like, all right, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna make this free and we're gonna see where it lies and where, where the chips fall. And um, it's kind of a funny thing because I used to have so much security financially and now I have no security financially at all. And I find myself to be a, a lot more joyful. And um, a friend of mine just recently said that security seems to be a barrier to joy and happiness. Insecurity seems to promote joy and happiness if you accept it properly. And I'm kind of finding that to be true in the actual practice of it. Mm. Because I used to have so much financial security and I was pretty miserable and now I have literally no financial security and I find a lot more joy in my life and it's uh, it seems to be counterintuitive, but it's definitely the way it's been going. So I, I think we've meant we've like talked about everything, but the actual like name of the company and the the website and everything. So oh, it's, yeah. so it's ChristCenteredCapital.com. dot com. What yeah. can people get like if they go to the website right now? Like what do they just sign up and they can pledge? What else can they do on the website? Yeah, so you can go to Christ Center Capital. We strongly suggest this is one of the ways that hopefully we can actually produce money to uh, revenue to actually fund it is sign up for the newsletter. Uh, please sign up for the newsletter. It's completely free. Everything on the site is completely free. But if you sign up for the newsletter, that gives us a pull of saying like, hey, this many people care about moral investing. And that's like our, our number one metric. So please sign up for the newsletter. It's right there on the homepage, ChristCenterCapital.com. You just type in your name, phone number, email kind of thing. And that helps us so much and of course if you feel um, called to give like a financial pledge that's great too but uh, I think our last report just came out on this past Friday there was about eight assets that made it into our report they're timely assets you can go check that out it's completely free we rate them uh, if you explore our website there's so many different things there's a lot of like DIY, do-it-yourself investing context. We really encourage people not to be passive investors, but to be active investors. Um, that's really key to be a moral investor because you don't want to reap where you have not sown. Like even if you're investing into stocks and everything, like you participate in those shareholder meetings. Maybe you feel like your voice is minuscule, or you know you only own one or two shares. Your vote doesn't really count. Participate. Like be an active investor. Know what you're investing in and all of the content on our site is geared to help you do that. Uh, we have mock portfolios. If you're someone who just wants to dabble into getting started investing for yourself, we give you a bunch of assets that have passed our moral screening tests and you can, uh, we divvy them up percentage wise. You can invest for yourself uh, copying that if you want to do so. Um, and we have uh, our rating system is color coded. So if you go to our site, Red assets, assets that are stocks, bonds, crypto, ETFs, all that stuff that are highlighted red, those failed our moral screening tests. Um, our colors are gold and purple, so the, the purple assets, the assets are highlighted purple. They passed, but not exactly with flying colors. Like there's still some, you know, little uh, uh, pockets of things that we don't really like about those. And then we have the gold assets, which are few and far between, as you could imagine, because in reality, there's only about four or five Christian companies that are publicly traded on the stock exchange right now. And out of literally 14,000 or something like that. So, but the gold assets are the ones that really pass those, uh, those moral screening tests with flying colors. And you know, a Christian could probably feel good about investing in those, but yeah, we still say, make sure that you invest and participate. Like if you're investing even in one of those gold assets that they're not doing anything nefarious with your money or anything like that, they're just focusing on their business, doing their business well, like still participate in the shareholder meetings because you never know when those companies could go the other way. You know, we have companies that come in and out of good graces 
all the time as we monitor them. So as we close out, the, is there anything that we sort of haven't discussed about your story, uh, even even just about Christ Center Capital? Is there anything that we haven't really touched on that we need to uh, to mention? No, I think we covered it pretty much. Um, the one thing like, I want to... What would you leave with the audience? I want to leave people with this, and it's whenever you invest in something, that means you want that something to grow in power and influence. So really think about that in your investing world. As you look at your 401ks, as you look at your IRAs, as you look at your personal portfolios, know that whatever you invest in, that means you want that thing, that person, whatever it is, to grow in power and influence. And you'll probably find that a lot of the things in your portfolios are not things you want to grow in power and influence and really influence culture. Because remember, it's great to go protest things and, you know, to take to the streets and, you know, have YouTube channels and all this stuff. And But words are words, you know. Actions always speak louder than words, right? We always, we've learned that when we were like little kids. And investing is true action because when you take action with your money, with your pocket, you know, with your bank accounts, that usually speaks the loudest. And so I say we have a little saying at Price Center Capital, and it's, you know, Christian investing equals a Christian culture because secular investing equals a secular culture. So if you really want to influence the culture, you got to take a look at how you're investing. Yeah, and that's something that, I mean, as you've been talking today, that's something that I've got to think more about too is these investments that you're doing yeah, it does seem like it, it is going to affect things to a pretty severe degree, or at least it can. Yeah, and that's it can kind if of you it. get enough people behind it. Exactly, and that's kind of the idea of it. Yeah. Well, Mark, uh, thanks for coming on to Capturing Christianity. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, we've no, got, We've covered me. a lot of ground, and uh, your story is just so cool. I'm so glad that we could get it out for the public. So thanks for coming on. It's been awesome. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, thanks for joining me today on Capturing Christianity. I've been Cameron Bertuzzi with Mark Lozano, and I will see you in the next Capturing Christianity video very soon. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now, and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true? <laughs>